Good morning, uh, you all, and congratulations for being uh, the early risers. As uh, Washington said sometime, well, I re don't remember the quote, so I won't try and make it. So um, I'm Jean-Pierre Filiu, I'm Associate Professor at the Middle East uh, Studies Program here in Sciences Po, and I wanted uh, to open this uh, uh, session by uh, stressing how fortunate and grateful we are at Sciences Po to Carnegie. Uh, I was hoping uh, Fabrice Potier would be here so I'd, I would even greet him more personally because uh, we learned a lot during this uh, already one day and probably more today through the exchange of experiences and this uh, smiling spirit of partnership and I wanted to stress how important it is uh, for us, the academic community at Sciences Po, our students and people uh, connected uh, with us. So yesterday we had the privilege to listen to a fascinating presentation about Iraqi domestic perspectives and its regional uh, environment. One of the purpose of this conference that uh, is co-organized by uh, Carnegie Europe and Sciences Po is to highlight how central the Iraqi issue still is, no matter how strong is the perception that the planned withdrawal of US forces means the end of the problem. Uh, yesterday, Fabrice uh, mentioned, opening the conference, how AFPAC had stolen most of the attention from Iraq, while the U.S. involvement is still so high with a long-term commitment. In order to address this crucial American dimension of the Iraqi equation, we are fortunate enough to have with us today Ambassador Ryan Crocker, who until last February was the American ambassador to Baghdad, after having served as a U.S. ambassador to uh, Pakistan, which gives him an extraordinary perspective on the whole crisis crescent. His regional and linguistic expertise is widely respected, and I will not recall the former president calling him U.S. Lawrence of Arabia, or General Petraeus being proud to be his military wingman. I had the privilege to know Ambassador Crocker when he was U.S. Ambassador to Syria in quite a troubled period, when I was myself French Deputy Chief of Mission, and uh, uh, we learned the hard way this basic principle of Middle Eastern diplomacy, no French embassy can feel safe when a U.S. embassy is attacked. Among his various experiences, I just underlined that as Chargé d'Affaires in uh, Kabul and Ambassador in Baghdad, he led the first bilateral talks with his Iranian counterpart after nearly three decades of no direct dialogue. Christopher Dickey is the Paris Bureau Chief and Middle East Regional Editor for Newsweek. So first, let me greet a great U.S. reporter who still considers Paris as the best launching pad to cover and report Middle East affairs. An award-winning journalist, he contributes widely to Foreign Affairs, New York Review of Books, and various prestigious magazines. His last book, Securing the City, has been out since February. It's all about NYPD. I have not read it yet, but I strongly recommend his previous novel, The Sleeper. It's a fascinating thriller filled with first-hand experience of the terrorist underworld, a must-read. Marina Otawe is the director of the Middle East program at the Carnegie Endowment for Peace, a program that includes Iraq, and she works on issues of political transformation in the Middle East and of Gulf security. She has also written extensively on political reconstruction in Iraq. Her last book is Beyond the Facade, Political Reform in the Arab World, edited with Julia Schuker Visoso. And since Marina was kind enough to welcome me uh, at the Carnegie in Washington two months ago, I am so glad to be able to reciprocate today for this fascinating conference. So ladies and gentlemen, we are really fortunate. Let us turn to Ryan Crocker. Uh, thank you, Jean-Pierre, and good morning to uh, all of you. Let me add my, my own thanks um, both to Carnegie Europe and to um, Sciences Po for uh, uh, convening this uh, important conference. Uh, uh, I think all of us, whether in diplomacy and politics, um, in academia, indeed even in the media, have a certain tendency to follow the flavor of the moment. And the flavor of the moment, of course, is, um, is um, Afghanistan, Pakistan. 
Uh, it is, uh, I think, critically important that we not lose sight of, um, as it were, the center of the Middle East, uh, which is uh, Iraq. And again, as we heard yesterday, Iraq is very much uh, a work in progress and uh, an undetermined outcome, and it behooves us all to be paying attention. Uh, today, of course, is that momentous day, uh, June 30th. Um, but as I, I mentioned uh, yesterday evening, um, it's not just that the future is now. Uh, June 30th is a date on a calendar that marks the culmination of a process that has been underway for months. Um, and that process, of course, is the redeployment of U.S. forces out of populated areas uh, in Iraq. Um, and again, I, as I think everyone here understands, um, that doesn't mean that um, uh, there are no longer U.S. soldiers in Iraqi cities. Um, there are. They are simply not there uh, uh, as elements of organized U.S. combat units. Uh, they are there uh, as, um, as trainers and as embedded advisors. And that latter role, uh, again, is... Uh, all of you who have followed events in Iraq know, is particularly important. It uh, was embedded advisors during the Basra campaign of the spring of 2008, both um, American and British, that played a critical role um, uh, moving uh, through Basra, uh, embedded with Iraqi combat formations, um, kind of uh, advising under fire, as it were, but also playing that crucial role of um, um, uh, force multiplication and enablers to um, air combat teams and so forth. So that will go forward. Um, uh, it's also important to remember that, um, well, Many may think that Iraq is yesterday's story. Uh, there are still um, approximately 130,000 um, uh, uh, U.S. troops uh, in Iraq, uh, a number uh, uh, larger than the force structure current and um, uh, proposed in Afghanistan by multiples. Um, the, the way forward in the U.S.-Iraqi relationship uh, is in some respects uh, a matter of black and white uh, because it is a matter of the two agreements that we painstakingly negotiated with the Iraqis uh, during the course of 2008. The uh, security agreement, of course, has had the uh, lion's share of the focus, but as um, uh, Saif Adin Abdurrahman uh, noted yesterday, uh, over the longer run, it is the second agreement, the Strategic Framework Agreement, um, that I think uh, will have larger significance for the U.S., for Iraq, for the region, and for the international community. Uh, I'll say just a word on the, um, the security agreement. Uh, uh, as I noted, we, we still have 130,000-plus uh, troops in Iraq. Um, the agreement envisions uh, a U.S. military presence uh, in Iraq uh, until the end of 2011. That's two and a half years from now. And again, in an Iraqi context, if you rewind, rewind the film to where things were two and a half years ago, look at where they are today, I think uh, we can all understand that to talk about uh, what the situation in Iraq at the end of 2011 may be um, is um, uh, truly a leap of imagination. Uh, President Obama, in his uh, speech in March, uh, spoke of a residual force uh, in Iraq from uh, August 2010 up until the end of 2011 of uh, 35 to 50,000 troops. Uh, uh, his uh, articulation of his way forward was very much consistent with the recommendations that General Odierno and I uh, put forward to the new administration uh, immediately after uh, the Obama team took office. Uh, the Strategic Framework Agreement. Um, again, what we and 
the Iraqis are determined not to do is recreate the past uh, uh, in, in a number of respects, including the security uh, uh, relationship. Uh, we are not looking at Baghdad Pact II or a new Central Treaty Organization. We tried that. It didn't work spectacularly well uh, uh, for Iraq, for the region, or for Western interests. So the emphasis, I think, needs to be on the, uh, the non-security dimensions of the relationship going forward, and that, of course, is what the Strategic Framework Agreement lays out, um, a, a blueprint, uh, as it were, for cooperation between Iraq and the United States uh, uh, in virtually every relevant aspect of bilateral relations. Uh, uh, economic uh, cooperation, um, and part of this will be our, our trade relationship. Um, at the time I left Iraq, we were uh, talking about putting together a major U.S. trade and investment mission uh, to Iraq. Uh, I think it is extremely important that we uh, develop our commercial ties. Uh, also in, um, in, in science, in, in rule of law, in culture, and in education, and I, I would just stress that latter point. Uh, the Iraqi government has placed a, a huge emphasis on educational opportunity, including scholarships abroad. Uh, uh, they have put their money where their mouth is uh, in the early part of this year, doubling the size of the um, uh, U.S. Iraqi Fulbright program um, by uh, putting in a share of funding that, uh, of Iraqi funding that now matches the U.S. funding. Uh, and again, when one looks at the past, uh, the, the years, the decades in which Iraqi students did not have the opportunity by and large to study in the U.S. or uh, in, in many respects in the West at all, uh, this is an extremely important investment in Iraq's future and one that I think behooves the United States to uh, uh, pay full attention to. Uh, it, it's probably a moment to, again, provide a bit of perspective. Uh, in terms of where Iraq might go, it's helpful to look again at where Iraq has been. And for uh, virtually half a century since the 1958 revolution, uh, Iraq has defined itself uh, uh, in opposition to, if not in outright confrontation with, the United States and the West generally. Uh, June 30th is an important day, uh, as we noted yesterday, in another respect. Um, uh, this is when the, um, uh, the bids are submitted for a technical services agreement by uh, major oil companies, including a number of Western oil companies. Uh, and while it is not the arrangement that uh, many of those companies ha had hoped for, um, it nonetheless does provide the, um, the potential for an entirely new beginning of Iraq's relationship uh, with the West through Western oil companies, a relationship that really has not existed as uh, since the early 1970s. Uh, so there is the opportunity to see an Iraq develop that will play a fundamentally different role regionally, as we discussed yesterday, but also internationally. Um, that will not be easy. Uh, it will, will require enormous effort on the part of Iraqis um, uh, and their friends I, I use the term strategic patience uh, because, as I have said over and over again, uh, Iraq is hard, it's going to go on being hard, and it's hard all the time. Uh, none of these issues that Iraq faces are easy. Um, uh, I think the term grand bargain was used yesterday. I, I have to tell you I do not believe in grand bargains in an Iraqi context, certainly not now. Uh, Iraqis will chip their way through these challenges uh, one at a time uh, with some critical assistance uh, from their friends in the international community. Um, 
turning points, I think, will only be recognized in hindsight. Um, uh, it is going to require perseverance, again, most fundamentally on the part of Iraqis, but also on the part of the international community and certainly on the part of the United States. Uh, President Obama got a good handoff uh, uh, from the previous administration, both in terms of the situation on the ground uh, and in terms of the, um, the agreements that provide, again, a blueprint or a roadmap for the future of that relationship. And it's, um, I think, significant to note that those agreements were concluded exactly at the time of our presidential election, uh, negotiated uh, under the Bush administration, signed uh, after the election, um, after President Obama had already won the election. So the continuity is there, um, uh, but it is important to follow up. Uh, uh, it may have been President Bush's war after 2003, but since January 21st, um, it is now President Obama's war uh, in America, um, or perhaps more accurately, um, his opportunity at a peace uh, in Iraq, in the region, and internationally that we literally have not seen in, um, in half a century. Uh, it's also, uh, I would suggest, very much um, Europe and the international communities war or peace. Uh, uh, Joe Sabah said something um, uh, that struck me yesterday uh, that, uh, if I've got it right, Joe, that uh, 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 Iraq requires on the part of all of us uh, a willingness to act or to accept the consequences of inaction. Um, and I would suggest to you uh, inaction uh, not so benign neglect at a critical period uh, inside Iraq uh, would indeed have profound and profoundly negative consequences. Um, I Iraq is reaching out. It, it's not a question, I think, of the West uh, forcing itself on Iraq. Um, I, I was struck in the um, first half of April 2008. This was when uh, Basra, Sadr City, and Maison um, uh, uh, were still pretty hot battles. And, but during that time, Nouriel Maliki, who is not known for uh, a penchant uh, uh, for a lot of international travel, nonetheless left Iraq to come to Europe, uh, to Brussels, uh, for meetings with uh, NATO and with the European Union. Uh, and I, I, I think that's significant, that he would leave Iraq at a time of, um, uh, of real crisis because he saw engagement with NATO uh, and the EU to have that degree of importance for him. Um, now, I know we have a panel right after this that is going to um, uh, talk about the Iraqi-European relationship, um, uh, but I cannot resist the opportunity to uh, offer a few thoughts uh, uh, preemptively on that. Um, uh, SAIF yesterday talked about uh, Turkey's role in uh, training Iraqi armed forces. Um, there is the opportunity for a broader NATO role. The NATO training mission um, has been uh, active in Iraq for some time. Uh, I think uh, uh, as we uh, move forward with U.S. redeployments, it is a time for NATO not to step up in terms of uh, uh, troop deployments, obviously, but to, um, to play a more robust role in uh, training Iraq's security forces, because this is not just about military proficiency. Uh, it's about the whole relationship between security forces and the population um, they are to protect and defend. Uh, and NATO, with its varied experience, um, I think has a great deal to offer, uh, frankly, a great deal more to offer than is on the table so far. So that would certainly be one thought I would have. Um, and I, I, since we talked about Turkey yesterday, I would just add parenthetically that this um, might be time to, um, for, for Europeans to take a, 
another look or a fresh look or a relook uh, at the whole question of European Turkish relations, uh, but that would be the subject of another conference. Uh, um, there was a brief mention of the international compact with Iraq, and again, I would underscore the potential importance of this forum. Uh, that brings uh, uh, not just the West, but the international community broadly into engagement at the economic level uh, with Iraq. Uh, I hope very much that this effort does not lose momentum, uh, because how Iraq develops economically um, is, as um, was pointed out uh, yesterday by Joe Seba, in, in many respects, not only as important as how it develops politically, but inextricably linked to political development. Um, the United Nations, um, under Stefan de Mistura, we saw a return to UN engagement, UN activism. I hope very much that this continues uh, uh, with his successor. Uh, we talked a bit about the potential for Europe uh, France in particular, to engage in areas such as rule of law. Um, uh, SAFE made the observation that the Iraqi legal system is, of course, much closer to the, the French model than it is to the U.S. Uh, I was pleased to see the Sorbonne, through um, a professor in the UAE, uh, take this on, and that is something we have facilitated, and I'll come back to that um, uh, in just a moment. Uh, there is an enormous role for the, um, the internationals. Uh, uh, the World Bank, which is on the ground, um, although not very robustly, and the International Monetary Fund, which is not. Um, uh, this is a time, in my view, for both organizations uh, to be increasing their, their role in Iraq and their presence, uh, because as was pointed out yesterday, uh, you, you really can't do effective engagement uh, by parachuting in experts. You, you have to have the on-the-ground relationships. And, and right now, we may have um, a unique situation with Iraq in which uh, uh, you, you have a, a developing country that is eager for more engagement with both the bank and the fund. Um, uh, so I, I hope that we will see both organizations uh, relook at their presence and their priorities and ramp up engagement on the ground there. Uh, let me say a final word again, coming back to the U.S. Um, uh, we can play an important role as facilitator. Uh, Iraq is still a semi-permissive permissive environment. Um, it is not a full post-conflict situation. Uh, it is dangerous. Uh, we do have the presence, we do have the resources, and we have put them at the disposal of the international community. The United Nations is co-located uh, in six places in Iraq with our provincial reconstruction teams. They're actually there embedded with our PRTs. Uh, we don't direct their agenda, but we do provide perimeter security and we provide movement security. Uh, it is certainly something that we could do for other international organizations. And as we saw in provincial elections, um, it is something we are ready to do for um, third country representatives as well. Um, so I guess the, the bottom line here uh, for all of us, uh, whatever anyone thought about 2003, it's not 2003 anymore. Um, uh, what happens going forward uh, for the United States, for Europe, for the international community, above all for Iraqis themselves, uh, is going to be of criti critical significance. Um, there is an opportunity. Um, there is a framework for the United States, uh, but more broadly speaking, I think, for the international community uh, for that engagement, and I hope very much that uh, that is the direction we will see events move and that this conference will be a, a means of focusing that attention. Thank you very much, Excellency. Um, now we turn to Christopher Dickey, please. Come to me for the bad news, right? Um, 
Thank you very much for inviting me here today. I didn't have a huge amount of time to prepare, but I've been following Ryan's remarks and thinking for such a long time, I thought probably I could react to them. Um, I think he's done, I think Ryan's done a great job, and the United States has done a great job in Iraq over the last couple of years trying to stabilize a, a, what seemed just a couple of years ago a completely untenable situation. But it's not enough just to say it's not 2003 anymore. In fact, the United States went into Iraq with certain assumptions in 2003 that are the legacy that you have to deal with today. And essentially, although it was denied a million times, what the Bush administration set out to do in 2003 and early 2004 was to create a dependent state in Iraq. And what you see now with the fireworks going off, uh, literally the fireworks, not figuratively the fireworks going off in Baghdad and the celebrations in the streets, is a celebration of a step away from that dependency. What Ryan's outlining is an effort to move away from that dependency, but precisely because uh, Iraq is Iraq and it is a hard country and they are a hard people and they are fiercely independent not only independent as a nation, Iraq, but often independent of each other, uh, you have a situation where the American presence is going to be, I think, less and less tenable. We'll lower our profile. We'll get down to 35 to 50,000 troops uh, in 2011. But I think we'll probably start to see a rather uh, dramatic reduction at that point. I think you're going you're gonna, to, once you start to pull out this is something the Israelis learned in South Lebanon, for instance. Once you start the process of pulling out, people start to realign their uh, friendships, alliances, intelligence re relationships. And I think we're going to find ourselves in a weaker and weaker position as that process moves forward, even if the Iraqis themselves are better able to control their, secu their own security situation. Uh, they will notice, as indeed they do notice, that Iraq is essentially unable to defend itself in one of the toughest neighborhoods in the world. There are, um, between police and the military, there are about a million men and women under arms now in Iraq, and they're all trained to kill Iraqis. They're not trained to defend the borders of the country, and they're not trained to defend the country from foreign aggression, whether it comes from uh, Iran, a traditional enemy, uh, or even uh, such countries as Turkey, uh, should there be problems in the north. Um, I think, actually, since I brought up Iran, I think that that is an area where we need to look, in terms of Iraq's future, very, very carefully, because it's not now just going to be a question of Iraq, Iran messing around in Iraq. There's also a question of what kind of incentives may be given to Iraq or factions in Iraq to mess around in Iran. There's a very complicated situation developing here right now. I just was talking the other day to a very, not an Iraqi, but a very, very well-connected uh, Arab official. And I said, how do you see the situation in Iran right now? And he said, well, we think Iran is now completely absorbed with its internal problems, whatever happens. And we think that's a good thing. I said, you think you might encourage them to be even more absorbed for a longer time? And he said, yeah, I think we probably will. He said, I think there are a lot of problems with the Kurds and with the Azeris. And there have been for a long time. And those might be encouraged. Once you start to play those kinds of games, an already dangerous situation is going to become incalculably more dangerous and complicated. So while I think uh, certainly we're off to a good start uh, since uh, General Petraeus and, uh, and Ambassador Crocker took over, uh, and they have laid uh, groundwork for a good handoff, uh, we, we really, Ryan's not kidding when he says, we're just at the beginning of this story. And I think I'll, I'll leave it at that with those happy thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much for these happy thoughts. And now to be even more happy, I will turn to, to Marina. Sorry.
Uh, good morning. I've never been uh, accused of uh, uh, expressing too happy thoughts because I tend to be rather a pessimist. Uh, I think Ambassador uh, Crocker did a wonderful job of laying out what is the policy, uh, uh, what are the assumptions on which the United States is leaving the country. Uh, and what strikes me in this situation is that in a sense, the Obama administration is pulling out of Iraq under the same assumptions as the Bush administration went into Iraq. That is, that the, uh, under a best case scenario. Uh, we went into, uh, the Bush administration went into Iraq on the assumption that uh, it would be a relatively easy uh, job to do, uh, buying the idea that the United States would be very well received, and frankly sweeping under the rug all the issues that, uh, uh, that many people had worn would arise as soon as uh, as the, uh, the United States became involved. I think we are leaving the country also under a best case scenario. And perhaps it's the only way in, on the assumption that everything is going to unfold on the basis of a best, uh, of a best case. I think the, uh, uh, the, the, the description that uh, Ambassador Crocker just gave us of the strategic framework agreement and what are the really important things that are going to under, uh, underlie the relation between the United States and Iraq in the future is a best case. This is not a security agreement. This is based on uh, it, what is important is non security dimension. And then he went on to talk about a blueprint for cooperation on the, uh, on the economy, on trade, the issues of investment, the science, rule of law, culture, and education. Now, this is all very good as long as the security dimension, of course, holds. And this is the, uh, and this, uh, this is the big question mark. Because as Chris Dickey said, and one of the advantages of being the last speaker is you can pick up on, what other, on other people's comments, is when you remove that large number of troops, which may, and as you said, that the removal may in the end be even faster than envisaged, something can change drastically in the equation. It's difficult to believe that removing uh, 100,000 American troops, 130, you know, no matter what the number is, is not going to change the relationship among Iraqi groups because the Iraq that we know today and the Iraq on uh, on the progress of which the withdrawal plan is based is going to be quite uh, different once the troops are removed. And what is very difficult is to know exactly how Iraq is going to be, uh, is going to be changed by the removal of the troops. I'm not saying that we are necessarily going to go back to 2006 and, uh, you know, the, the kind of the civil war situation and I think it's better to call it a civil war and not an almost civil war that was the language that was used at, at that time. I'm not saying necessarily that that is going to be uh, that that is going to be what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen, but I think the, po the problem is that none of us really knows what's going to happen once you remove that many troops, once you remove that stabilizing uh, that stabilizing factor. And if that is the case. There is no plan B, as far as I can tell. In other words, I don't think that there is an, that, that at this point that the Obama administration has a real idea about how to handle the situation if things do not unfold according to this best case scenario on which all the, uh, uh, the you know, all the planning, uh, all the planning is based. Uh, let me pick up on a few points specifically, which I think are very, uh, are very important. What I find of great concern is the fact that, that there are, uh, uh, essentially we are start, that the process, we are not starting the process from the beginning, or at least when we envisage the process that's going to take place, it, we are not looking at what is the beginning. Uh, we discussed yesterday, uh, Saif the, uh, the talked about the 
uh, the strengthening of the institution, the building of the institutions, and in the importance of that pro uh, process, not necessarily democracy yet, but, uh, but at least the building of a state based, uh, of a state based on institutions. I don't think I know of any case in any country of a, where institutions were built without a political agreement under, underlying the institutions. In other words, the, the process of institutional development, it's usually built on the basis of some sort of agreement on the rules of the game, on the outline. I don't think that, that agreement is quite clear in Iraq at this point. The constitution is still contested terrain. The issue of federalism is still very much contested test the terrain. It's very difficult to start building institutions if, it, if the, the, there is no political agreement on the basics. And those are not technical issues. We can train as many people as we want. And I don't mean for a moment to, to uh, play down the importance of training of personnel in the building of institutions. But if the agreement is not uh, there, those people, those people will end up by doing other things, essentially, because those, those institutions are not uh, are not going to work. Uh, there was a time after the beginning of the surge when the United States was talking about uh, uh, the importance of Iraq meeting certainly po uh, certain political benchmarks uh, uh, in order for the United States role to continue. We abandoned the benchmarks. I think Ambassador Crocker, as he said himself, had a lot to do with the sort of erasing talk of the benchmarks. But the fact is that the benchmarks, they may have been naive and misplaced in the sense of saying, you know, you have to do this, you have to achieve those targets within three months or whatever it was. But the so-called benchmarks still pointed to important unfinished business in Iraq that was important for the stabilization of the country. And most of the benchmarks have not been met. In other words, what I mean here, what, was, what were open questions back two years ago are very much open questions uh, uh, still at the present time. Uh, so the, the great concern is what now if things do not continue unfolding on the basis of this best case scenario that we have uh, embraced, in which perhaps it was the only way the United States could move on, frankly, by assuming that everything would go for the best. And what I worry about is that I think the options for the United States are greatly diminishing if things don't go according to plan, uh, for two reasons. One is that the United States, and this is a very good thing, is not going to be free to call the shots in Iraq the way it did for a while after 2003. I mean, there is a return to Iraqi sovereignty, and I think obviously this is a, uh, uh, this is a very good thing. Second, the United States is simply not going to have the resources to commit to Iraq in the future. Uh, the, uh, the, the emphasis, as we have said many times in the course of this conference, has, uh, has shifted away from Iraq you know, to Afghanistan and to Pakistan, and I suspect that it will shift even more towards Pakistan in the, uh, in the coming months uh, if things continue the way they are doing. Uh, they are so that as a result, there are very, very few options. Uh, I don't think I'm going to elaborate a lot more. I think I'll stop uh, here and open for discussion. But uh, just in conclusion, there is a plan A, which is very good, but also that has a lot of uh, chances of not going, uh, that things have a, a, a large chance of not going according to, to plan A, and then there is no plan B as far as I can tell. Thank you. So thank you very much. It was a fascinating presentation. Uh, I was very much struck by the idea of the continuity between the two administrations, the way the main pillars of the bilateral relationship were negotiated and in fact signed during the transition, and the way the same assumptions uh, could be uh, still uh, in place, the, the whole uh, bet on the best case scenario. But let's hope that uh, worst scenarios are not always the most uh, uh, possible. 
Uh, there were, if you remember, from 2003 until now, so many talks about Iraq becoming the black hole of the Middle East and engulfing the neighboring state into uh, a, a new set of crises. It didn't happen, basically because probably, as Chris uh, said, one million armed Iraqis were too busy killing each other than exporting their violence outside. On the other uh, side, and seen from Europe, one cannot but uh, underline the fact that there was no Al-Qaeda in Iraq before 2003. And even though Al-Qaeda is significantly weakened in Iraq right now, it is still there somewhere, in Mosul and in other places. And uh, when I had the privilege to, to, to be at the, at the Carnegie two months uh, ago, it was all about also to, to put into focus the fact that the whole process that led to Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb was deeply connected with the enfolding of the Iraqi crisis. So all this is not without uh, consequences on the security of this uh, continent. So now the uh, floor is open to, to questions, and please identify yourself, introduce yourself before asking what should be a question. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, Ahmed El Shikaki from Geneva. My question is to Mr. Crocker. Uh, we heard yesterday and today that Iraq is hard uh, to govern. Uh, and I just want to ask you about the fact, this fact, is the United States realized this fact before 2003 or after 2003 and the preparation that do it. And we have the fear as Iraqis because the United States planned to win the war but not to win the peace or to build the country after the war. Now we have the fear that the United States will plan to a peaceful withdrawal of their forces, but not planned for a future after withdrawal from Iraq. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, maybe uh, we take two or three. Yes, François Dalençon, a journalist with La Croix, the French daily. Uh, I have a question for Ambassador Crocker. Uh, what has been your experience of the Iranian involvement in Iraq, uh, political, economical, uh, and military, and uh, how do you expect it will evolve uh, after the latest events in Iran? Okay. I'm just, uh... George Malbruno from Le Figaro. Uh, I would like to, uh, to listen to Ambassador Crocker uh, answers to what said uh, Marina Ottaway about the, the difficulty to build institutions where you don't have any political agreement particularly on, she said about the benchmark which have not been met on debasification, oil law, area disputed, etc. So could you tell us uh, why this benchmark have been uh, abandoned and why these uh, this, uh, laws have not been uh, passed by the parliament and perhaps also your assessment about the, the performance of Nouri al-Maliki recently. Not the, the, thank you. Ambassador. <laughs> It's up to you. Uh, okay, could I subcontract some of that? Yes. Uh, Black well, water the, is in the, um, house. The, the future after the withdrawal of U.S. forces, and, and again, um, that withdrawal in its totality is two and a half years away. And I, I, um, I guess in response to Marina's point, about plans A and B, um, well, plan A incorporates plan B. Um, that's why we're talking about a two and a half year horizon for full withdrawal. That is why um, uh, for, uh, for the next year, uh, you're gonna see force levels uh, uh, continue uh, at, a, at a very robust um, uh, level. Um, because uh, we and the Iraqis understand that there are no certainties here, um, uh, that we've got to have the, the capability and the flexibility, uh, we collectively, to adjust to whatever may come down the road, and I think we are, um, again, together postured to do that. Um, 
but after withdrawal, and as withdrawal takes place, uh, again, that's, I think, the importance of the uh, elements of the Strategic Framework Agreement that, that provides for uh, U.S.-Iraqi engagement on a whole set of issues and interests um, uh, that include security but go well beyond it. Uh, that is a blueprint for a long-term future relationship uh, that uh, should extend well well past the end of 2011. And again, I, I would suggest modestly, I hope, that uh, it can serve as um, a blueprint as well for broader international agreement uh, with Iraq. We already have the ICI, but I think the Strategic Framework Agreement uh, is uh, the kind of thing that other countries should look at as um, uh, at least a reference point for their own long-term uh, relationships with Iraq. Uh, and that is how the future can be fundamentally different than the past, because Iraq did not have those relationships uh, 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 with the West, with the international community, even within the region. So um, I, I really do see uh, uh, a way forward here, uh, at least conceptually, uh, that will be altered by contact with reality. Um, uh, these things always are. But it at least is a blueprint, I think, going forward. Um, uh, uh, with respect to the Iranian role in Iraq, um, let me start by saying that um, particularly for Americans, American officials, former American officials, a, a good deal of um, modesty and humility is required uh, in terms of our capacity to, to really understand what goes on in an extraordinarily complex political culture uh, in which we have not had a representation on the ground for three decades. Um, uh, uh, Ambassador Gunter Mulak and I were uh, uh, together, among other places, in Damascus, and how hard it was, even if you're there, to figure out what was going on in Syria. Well, if you're not there, um, uh, it gets um, immeasurably more difficult. That said, um, I, I do not uh, think that the um, scenario that uh, Chris Dickey was recounting of um, uh, maybe some wishful thinking in the region that uh, Iran will now be totally preoccupied with its own affairs um, uh, is at all likely. Uh, 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 you know, whether it's Iran under the Shah, whether it is Iran um, uh, under the Islamists, Iran um, is, has been, and will continue to be Iran, and that is a country that sees itself as a regional power. Um, so Iran is going to continue to exert influence um, through a variety of means. My hope is that based on their experience in Iraq over the last uh, several years, which has not been entirely happy for them, um, they will reconsider uh, how that engagement and how that influence is exercised. Uh, uh, the militias... Uh, really were not a winning proposition for uh, Iran. The, uh, if they were thinking about a Lebanization of Iraq, um, I think Iraq showed that um, it's not Lebanon. Uh, so how the Iranians will calculate going forward, again, um, uh, I cannot begin to predict. But what I can predict with a reasonable confidence is they will continue to be engaged uh, in Iraq. It's just how that engagement is managed. Um, um, building institutions, um, you know, I, I guess I would, it's neither one thing nor the other. Um, I, I don't think in a complex society you, you get perfect agreement among communities and then get to work on institutions. Uh, the, the two kind of work together and uh, should reinforce each other. Um, I think we're seeing some of that. I've been impressed by the more assertive role of the Iraqi parliament uh, since the, um, the new speaker has been elected. Uh, we're, we're seeing parliament now assert itself. Uh, the, uh, the resignation of the trade minister, case in point. 
uh, where ministers are now being called before Parliament, having to account for their actions. The oil minister was up there. Uh, uh, that, of course, has opposite reactions as well, as the executive says, just a damn minute. Uh, uh, okay, that's all part of the evolution, I think, of institutions um, uh, in Iraq. So um, uh, they'll have to reinforce each other. Uh, uh, some degree of consensus is, of course, necessary. I don't think you're going to get full consensus before you can or should start on the process of institution building, and indeed the Iraqis are, are not waiting for it. Uh, uh, the question was posed about um, uh, the role of uh, uh, Prime Minister al-Maliki. I, I would just touch on one aspect of that because uh, it's come up in previous discussions, and I think it gets at this, this question of consensus, of institution building, and the enormous complexity of the challenges that Iraq still faces, the, the fact that they are, after six turbulent years, still at the beginning of a long, hard road. And that's the relationship um, of the uniformed forces to the state and the government. Um, uh, the um, prime minister has been criticized in, uh, in some circles for uh, what is called an extra-constitutional or extra-legal set of um, mechanisms. The, um, uh, the various regional operations commands that report directly to the, um, uh, the prime minister's office uh, rather than um, through the chain of command uh, uh, the, the military staff and the Ministry of Defense, the creation of an office of the commander-in-chief in the prime minister's office to um, further centralize authority there. I understand the concerns that um, lie behind these criticisms, but I, I would just suggest um, uh, an additional interpretation here, that this is, uh, whatever else it may be, it might also be an effort by a civilian authority to be sure that it is the authority vis-a-vis -a, -vis a military that has uh, a history of doing things for itself um, uh, in Iraq over the last half century. Uh, so uh, again, a very complicated issue that has more dimensions than I think are um, uh, immediately visible and part of the, uh, the vast amount of unfinished business that um, uh, Iraq uh, represents today, civil military relations, uh, federal, regional, provincial uh, authorities and relations, all of these things have to be worked through, but they have to be worked through, I think, um, not as a precondi precondition to institutional development, but, but in tandem with that development. Thank you very much. Saifuddin Abdurrahman, I have a question for Marina, and, uh, and it goes back to this issue of institutions and, and, and a political agreement. Um, what, what, in your mind, would be um, a base underlying political agreement before uh, you can um, have the institutional development uh, happen, uh, particularly because as, as contested as the Constitution or parts of the Constitution are, um, th there's still a framework, a base framework there in the Constitution that is in place that people are operating out of. So, so in that sense, there is a base um, underlying framework where people are working from. Even those people who disagree with parts of that base underlying framework, they acknowledge that that is the base uh, framework um, and, and, and are asking for revisions based on that same Framework. So, so, so I would wonder what, what in your mind would be the, the base underlying political agreement that needs to be there before the um, institutional development happens. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, Vincent Ujam, a staff reporter for the Foreign Desk of the French news magazine L'Express. Uh, a question to whom it may concern about the future relationship between Iraq and the U.S. Uh, as we may know, uh, with Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia, and to a certain extent Pakistan, it's not uh, very comfortable for a regime to be seen as a close associate uh, to uh, Washington. So what would be, uh, according to you, uh, the fine-tuning of the relationship between the future Iraq and the U.S.? Uh, is it something of a cold a partnership, a freezing partnership, or something more... I would say, uh, hot. Uh, how do you see that in the long run, even if it's a risky business, obviously? Thank you. I think I have not uh, explained very well what I meant. It's not a question of sequencing. It's not a question of saying, first, you have to reach you know, to get to a certain level of agreement and then you can start building the institutions. It's more that experience shows that when you start, that, that the, unless that agreement develops, the institutions never get consolidated. We have been watching the case, uh, to me what is a very frightening case, which is the case of Bosnia, and the case, the, there is another one, the case of it's not a country that anybody thinks very much about, but East Timor. Uh, that is, that were countries where major attempts were made, major investment was made by the international community in building institutions. And, for example, you see it in the case of Bosnia, there is still a sense that, you know, you need an international presence because those institutions, unless they are backstopped by an international presence, are not going to work because that consensus has never gelled. Uh, some of the things that I worry about, it's not just the constitution, but let me, uh, let me give you an example. How much, okay, we, there have been elections repeatedly in, uh, uh, in Iraq. There are going to be new elections now, uh, new parliamentary elections coming up. How much do those elections really allocate power in the country? In the sense that in all societies, particularly in a society where the parliamentary institutions, at least in the present form, are new, a lot of power goes outside the formal institutions. A lot of power, and we have seen it in the past in, uh, in Iraq, a lot of the power went through the militias, a lot of power went uh, through, uh, you know, now there is the, the sort of the, the, the sour, the, and so on and so forth. So that one of the questions is when these processes are put into place, to what extent are they are doing what they are actually supposed to do? One argument that you very often hear is, well, this is a reiterative, reiterative process. You have to do it over and over again. And usually the first elections really don't have very much to do with the distribution of power, but then you build it up and little by little this is, uh, 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 you know, it will end up to the situation that you have in stable democracies where, in fact, power only comes from the vote that only comes from uh, through the formal institutions. But it's a long process to go from there to here. And it's not clear to me at this point how much, uh, uh, how, you know, where in this process Iraq is, in the sense of how much of these institutions re and these political formal processes that have put in place really reflect what is the actual distribution of power in the country. I worry sometimes that we give too much importance to the elections and to the results of the elections. Maybe we are right, maybe we are not. But I think we tend to, to overlook the fact that, that there is still a lot of power which is exercised outside the institution. So it's not a question of sequencing, because if we wait, I think you are absolutely right, if we wait and the Ambassador Crocker is right, we cannot say we are going to wait until we have reached a certain point before we start working on the institutions. On the other hand, we should not delude ourselves that the institutions necessarily do what they are meant to do because of other factors that still exist and because of the lack of agreement on a lot of issues. Iraqi relations. 
I think, uh, I think the relations are going to be very troubled. I mean, I think that, you know, it's one of the ironies of the Middle East that if you go to Iran and you talk to the Iranians, they really love Americans in Iran. The Iraqis do not really love Americans. Uh, I was struck by a poll that was taken in the fall of 2003 when I was there uh, where they, the Iraqis were asked, this polling was just getting cranked up there, and Saddam didn't do a lot of it, uh, and the Iraqis were asked who their favorite foreign leader was in 2003. And of course the Americans had expected George Bush would be the man, but in fact Jacques Chirac was their favorite foreign leader. Uh, more recent uh, polls uh, that, that were carried out mm. by uh, uh, Zogby and um, the, uh, the, in uh, Shibli Talhami mm. showed mm. exactly the same thing. <laughs> so there is that basic irony to contend with. But also, the, I think that the Iraqis, Iraqi nationalism will continue to express itself as basically, anti, if not anti-Americanism, at least unease with the American relationship. And I think there's going to be a problem in that we are helping to create a, um, a technocratic class, a uh, bourgeoisie that is very dependent on us, but that may not represent a huge sector of Iraqi society. And there will be opportunities uh, for various kinds of political actors to exploit those resentments. I mean, one of the striking things about the success of the surge, one of the reasons that it was successful, was not just that finally we stabilized Baghdad, and not just that the people in Anbar got sick of Al-Qaeda, they also became convinced that the Americans were going to leave. When they were not convinced that the Americans were going to leave, when they thought the Americans were going to stay for good, they were going to fight the Americans. Am, am I right about that? Yeah. The, uh, and, you know, some good things have developed, but even with, the, with the now the, the oil contracts that are being bid on, you can see the tension that exists. One of the things the American administration wanted to do when it went into Iraq was to make sure that its oil, that American oil companies could get product sharing agreements, which essentially, which essentially means that they would own the oil in the ground. And that is a huge affront to Iraqi sovereignty. And the Iraqis have said absolutely not. And I think one of, the, one of the interesting things to watch in terms of the development of the relationship is how much the Iraqis now turn to American companies and how much they turn elsewhere in developing their oil industry. So just some random thoughts. And if I could uh, add to that, I suggested that um, uh, Chris go first so I could then attack him. Ah. Uh, but <laughs> I knew there was a plot there. <laughs> um, but actually, I would be more inclined to agree than disagree. Uh, I think the future of the relationship is going to have to be approached very, very carefully by, um, by both countries, uh, both peoples, um, in light of, again, uh, the nature of Iraq, Iraq's history, um, it is, uh, again, why it, it cannot be or be seen to be, I think, a relationship of dependency, uh, whatever may have been intended in the, uh, the earlier going. Um, uh, it is why, with all of the uncertainties um, uh, and, indeed, the risks that are inherent in a, um, a drawdown and a departure agreement for U.S. forces, in my view, that was absolutely essential. Um, uh, and indeed, I, I have been struck by the extent to which the security agreement in particular kind of took the issue uh, of U.S. force presence in Iraq uh, out of the political debate uh, in, in both the U.S. and Iraq. So, yes, there is risk, but the risk would be far higher, I think, without... Um, um, a carefully delineated set of timelines, uh, and it is why, again, uh, I, I said at the outset, one thing we absolutely do not want to do is recreate the past. Um, I do not see, um, although, again, who knows, but I do not see uh, uh, the future bilateral relationship moving in the direction of a formal alliance. 
Um, I, I do not see a U.S.-Iraqi military alliance uh, being part of the fabric of the future, because um, I don't think that is sustainable um, uh, in Iraqi political terms. It's also why I put emphasis in my own comments about the future of the U.S.-Iraqi relationship by stressing the importance of not just a U.S.-Iraqi relationship, but an international community Iraqi relationship. Uh, 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 I think uh, the extent to which the um, international community broadens and deepens its, uh, its ties uh, with Iraq uh, is going to be important uh, in the future, in the development and the future orientation of the country that they can do things, I think, with the international community broadly, the West broadly, uh, that might be politically very difficult for them to do only with the U.S., because um, uh, that's, that's, that's part of the equation, too, at least, uh, at least in my view. I just want to briefly, I think, it, uh, I agree with the, w what was said, but I think another piece of that equation is also going to be what Iraq's relation is with its neighbors, going back to the discussion the other time. That is, this is not a bilateral relation between Iraq and the West or the international community, whatever that might be, but it's also whether... It, it finds its place in the region again. And right now there is a tremendous amount of suspicions of the country surrounding, uh, by the country surrounding Iraq about what's happening in that country. So that's a relation that's going to take a while to develop, I think. The question is directed to the, to the entire panel and follow up to, to Marina's last comment. Since the broader topic of our, of our exercise yesterday and today uh, is, is collective security in the Gulf, most of the discussion so far has been essentially a bilateral one with respect to the U.S. withdrawal of, of military forces. Um, but the fact is also that U.S. forces, for example, have substantial presence in, in Qatar and in Bahrain and elsewhere in the Gulf. And then there are massive uh, economic commercial interests, and, and these go back a long time. I'd be interested in, in the views and suggestions of, of the panelists as to how, in, in the wake of, of the withdrawal of military forces, what actions might be taken by the U.S., whether under the Strategic Framework Agreement or otherwise, which might encourage the kind of collective security arrangements which in turn might make it possible, for example, to better exploit Iraq's petroleum resources, which might give it a chance to, uh, to, to, to develop a little bit further. I had uh, another two small questions to Ambassador Crocker. One about the, the relations between the central government and the Kurds. Uh, we have seen the Kurds in early June exporting for the first time oil. Do you think a, a clash is avoidable between Baghdad and the, the Kurds in the short term? And the second question about the, the relations with, with Syria. Um, at the beginning of this year, we have heard comments from the, the Pentagon mainly saying that Syria did a good job by preventing jihadists from entering to, to Iraq. And recently, we have heard different comments. How do you, uh, what's your assessment about the, the recent Syrian uh, role vis-à-vis uh, -vis, uh, Iraq? Thank you. So we are fortunate uh, yesterday to have a, uh, a great presentation by Peter Harling about uh, Syria and by Henri Barquet about the uh, KRG uh, central government relationship, but I'm sure that uh, Ambassador Croker will be glad to address your, your, your thoughts, uh, George. Well, on the um, two questions you pose, um, I think the, for all of the unresolved issues, uh, the tensions that prevail uh, between the Kurdish region uh, and the federal government uh, at the political level and between communities at the ethnic level, 
uh, I, I am reasonably optimistic over the long term that uh, Baghdad and Erbil uh, will find or, or will continue to construct a, a modus vivendi. Uh, uh, in, in discussions I've had with Kurds, uh, reflecting on their uh, long, difficult history in Iraq as well as elsewhere, you know, when you pose the question, um, what were the worst of times, you, you, you'll get a healthy debate as to what were the very worst of times. Uh, um, when you pose the question, what are the best of times, um, I, I didn't hear much of a debate. The best of times are right now, today, this is it. Um, um, uh, it's never been so good uh, for Iraq's Kurdish population as it is right now uh, in terms of uh, security, in terms of um, autonomy, um, uh, in terms of uh, economics, the 17 percent that the Kurds get from the, um, the oil revenues. Uh, again, a spirited debate every time that comes up. Should it be 14 percent? Should it be 17 percent? What about the census and so forth? Uh, but the fact is the, uh, the Kurds are getting far more uh, or considerably more um, from oil revenues broadly than they would get if uh, they actually had uh, the northern fields but no entitlement to what came from the south. So there are uh, there are certainly um, centrifugal forces at work, but the centripetal forces should not be, in my view, uh, underestimated either. So, again, like everything else in Iraq, it's going to be hard and it will be uncertain. There are no guarantees, but uh, 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 precisely because of a very bitter past, uh, I would be reasonably optimistic that uh, the Arabs and the Kurds, the federal government and the regional government uh, can work through issues uh, at least to the extent of avoiding um, a resort to violence. Uh, with respect to Syria, um, uh, Iraq and Syria, of course, have historically had um, a, um, a fairly difficult relationship. Uh, and I, I do not see the makings now of um, uh, uh, really a new period of strategic harmony between Damascus and Baghdad. Um, uh, and there are lots of reasons for that um, uh, that, that we could cover if, if, if people are interested. But it goes beyond what they're doing or not doing with respect to foreign fighters. Uh, that uh, uh, I don't know how we judge the flow now. I've seen uh, comments from... Um, uh, some U.S. commanders saying that they think that uh, the Syrians are tightening down. Uh, I hope that's true. Uh, I hope it stops completely. But uh, even if that were the case, um, I, I think the Iraqi-Syrian relationship, uh, with or without the added complication of the U.S. Uh, relationship with both countries, uh, is, is going to be a, a difficult, if not a completely strained one, going forward. And regarding Joe, yeah. And regarding Joe Sabah's question, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to add uh, something on the on the issue of Syria. Uh, the, I, I agree with what uh, the Ambassador Crocker just uh, just said, but I think in terms of what how much Syria is clamping down on movement of people across the border. I think it's worthwhile keeping an eye on, what's going, uh, on what is happening and what will happen in the negotiations between Syria and Israel. That is, I think Syria is in some sense trying to get on, maybe not on its best behavior, although for Syria might be the best behavior, but certainly on a better behavior because it has a much more important agenda on the Golan Heights, and it does not necessarily see the reason to antagonize the United States and antagonize Israel while that agenda is open. If it does not get anywhere, I would not be surprised if that uh, uh, the, sort of the cooperation on the border 
uh, decreased again. So it's, uh, it's another piece of that, uh, of that equation. And regarding Joseph, questions. Yes. Okay. Uh, on the issue of collective security in the, uh, in the Gulf, uh, I don't know what uh, uh, the United States could do to encourage collective security agreements. That is, what I see, l let me talk a little bit about what is in the way of collective security, of collective security agreement uh, there. Uh, there are, uh, in particularly uh, the Gulf countries at this point, remain extremely suspicious of Iraq because they see it, a, they, is a possible fifth column for Iran, very frankly. Gulf countries are, are scared to death of Iran at this point, but they do not want to antagonize Iran. One of the most interesting things in that relationship, <coughs> in that Gulf relationship, is that while in private, uh, all the Gulf countries talk about, uh, uh, there is no doubt that they see Iran as the, 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 as the danger and Iran as the enemy, in they really do not want to take an openly antagonistic relationship because, because Iran is too big a neighbor to be, uh, to be antagonized for these countries. So that there is a lot of, you know, if you look at the meetings of the GCC countries, a lot of the regional meetings and so on, Iran gets invited a lot. I mean, the, the Ahmadinejad gets invited by the king to go to the pilgrimage and the, uh, Granted, he cannot stop him from going to the pilgrimage, but he invites him to go to the pilgrimage. Uh, Iran w uh, was invited, uh, you know, was present at a number of these regional meetings. There is, there is still much greater hesitation on the part of the Gulf countries, in including Iraq, uh, because, uh, uh, because essentially they are not convinced yet that they have to deal with Iraq, and then there is still a... Uh, uh, they don't want to, they have been extremely reluctant in re-establishing diplomatic relationship with Iraq because in some ways there is a fear that they end up by doubling the presence of Iran because Maliki is seen as being too close to, uh, uh, is being too close to Iran. So uh, I don't know in this, uh, you know, very complicated set of relationship what can be done to encourage uh, uh, to encourage uh, uh, the regional cooperation. I mean, because the, uh, many of the Arab countries still don't know whether they want to cooperate with the Iraqi government or whether, in fact, uh, they want to, uh, to antagonize it openly. And they are not as afraid of Iraq as they are of Iran, so that they might very well do that. I wasn't sure what Mr. Seba was talking about, about how the collective security agreement would enable them to develop their uh, energy sector better. I wasn't sure what the, the last part of your question was. And I thought it was an interesting idea, but I just didn't quite, quite understand what the connection between the collective security was and Iraq developing its energy sector and oil sector. Without some degree of economic certainty or economic legality, mm. the predictability as to how contracts will resolve or put more physically how to protect property rights with some, some – because by nature, petroleum and exploration and development is capital intensive and essentially long term. Because of that, uh, a degree of security is necessary. Oil companies operate in some of the most adverse – political and environmental uh, situations imaginable. So they're quite skilled. And yet, in this case, uh, when you talk to them, they're looking for some kind of minimum uh, security uh, framework that would permit them to move in, whether it's the whole country, whether it's particular regions, but that requires, um, and if you look at, look, look at the whole GCC area along along the littoral of, of the Gulf waters. Those are very small countries, and the argument about being able to defend themselves, let's say, against any one or combination of much larger powers has for 200 years been, been limited to, to almost zero, frankly. 
Therefore, some forms of collective security have always been the norm in, along that uh, littoral. And that has permitted over time, certainly since uh, in, the, in the last century, it's a very substantial development which all of us benefit from, Europe, America, and Asia. The question is, is how to extend that? And that has not always resulted in a resolution of all the local disputes. It, it hasn't always transformed the political dynamic in, in domestically, but nevertheless it's been sufficient, for better and for worse, to permit that kind of development. How do you get that kind of umbrella extended a bit northward um, so that Iraq at the ports can clean up the pipelines? They're, they're a mess. They're full of bullet holes from the 1991 Gulf War uh, and even going before that to the Iran-Iraq War. Um, you get the pollution problems. You, you have serious physical issues. So the collective security would give the certainty for major companies to go in. Then there's a contractual security that they need so that when you have the predictable problems you're going to have in contract management, you have some predictable recourse. It may not be perfect, uh, but you can price it. And ultimately, you need to price it. And risk is what we're talking about, and risk is priced. So that's, okay. those are the factors I'm, I'm trying to get at. All right. Well, I, I, I would only say that I think Marina's response does basically address the, the core problem, which is there's no way to put together an alliance like that and articulate it without Iran seeing it as a hostile move and, in fact, raising tensions rather than lowering tensions, and particularly in the oil sector, where you've had, content, had so many fights for so long over territorial waters, um, I, I, I would think that would be tough. But let me, let me, can I just ask one question? I mean, this is sort of an evil question, but I, in two and a half years, when the Americans are just getting out of Iraq, Iran may be a nuclear power. Is an independent Iraq going to be interested in developing, it, developing its own uh, nuclear deterrence? Do you, think, do you think we could come full circle and suddenly face a situation where Iraq would become interested in a nuclear weapons program? I, I, uh, I think that it would not start with Iraq. Um, I, I think we would see uh, the acquisition of a nuclear weapons capability on the part of Iran um, uh, probably likely to trigger a similar quest in the region, but again, I don't think that would start with, um, uh, with Iraq. Uh, I do think it underscores how dangerous it would be uh, to um, uh, regional and indeed international security uh, uh, if Iran takes that step, uh, because uh, uh, it, it uh, it is highly likely to spark another further round of unstable proliferation. Um, uh, and then what the impact of that would be, uh, I think it'd become a, a third or fourth order consequence in Iraq. And how, how uh, an Iraq of 2012 uh, would look at its security, its place in the region, its relationship uh, with the international community and uh, assess what its options are is a level of complexity beyond me. But um, uh, again, a, a nuclear-armed Iran is, is going to shake up the entire region and well beyond. Okay. About collective security, Ambassador? Mm -hmm. uh, no, I, I just... Uh, uh, um, would... would comment that finding areas of common endeavor um, between the Gulf uh, and Iraq to me makes a lot of sense. Uh, um, security packs for the, the reasons that both uh, Marina and Chris have laid out uh, may be a bridge too far even if the Gulf were willing, which it isn't um, because of the Iranian factor. But uh, it would seem to me that, that well short of that, there is the potential for cooperation between uh, the Gulf states and Iraq on development of petroleum resources. Uh, that if, uh, you know, uh, again, there are a lot of capabilities in the Gulf, 
uh, that uh, it is an issue that should be on the table. Uh, but our ability to put it on the table, I, I would suggest, is pretty limited. Uh, I, I've, I've, I've made the rounds. Uh, you know, Dave Petraeus and I uh, cycled through uh, both together and separately, uh, you know, all of the Gulf and regional capitals um, uh, with, um, shall we say, some limited success. Uh, at least more ambassadors are now showing up in Baghdad from, uh, from the Arab states, but um, uh, the relationships within the region um, uh, are ultimately going to have to be defined by the states in that region uh, based on, uh, again, past performance, uh, our capacity to influence uh, regional states uh, as to how they should move forward with a relationship with Iraq has been pretty limited. Well, thank you very much. I think we reached uh, the end of this session, so I ask you to join me for uh, thanking again our uh, presenters. Thank you.